Well, I, I'm so grateful to be here with you all, and I really appreciate being invited to talk about one of my favorite subjects. I have to thank Rick Doblin and MAPS, the whole team at MAPS have been incredible about allowing me to participate in this important endeavor. I, I want to just, for full disclosure, uh, let me make sure I got this right here. I want to make sure to just say that I've never had any personal experience with marijuana. I'm not participating in the industry in any way, and I, I don't write certifications. I'm squarely focused on conducting marijuana research and eliminating the barriers to that research. So we're going to talk to you about a study that we've been trying to get going and see if we can give you a glimpse of how marijuana research is actually done and what the logistics are to try to make that happen. So um, I'm going to um, talk with you about this is a study where we're looking at the safety and efficacy of using five different dosages of marijuana, both smoked and vaporized, in combat veterans who have treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. And you, many of you have already heard this over and over about the um, the way that the DEA has scheduled drugs, the way they define the scheduling is really interesting because Schedule 1 is defined as a drug that has no medical value and a high abuse potential. And you can see here, you may not have seen the groupings that are under these different schedules. And I think it's really fascinating the way marijuana is lumped in with, with drugs that have a lot more toxicity. And yet you look at Schedule 4, uh, Schedule 4 is defined as a drug with low abuse potential and, and you know, some medical value. And what's fascinating is that drugs like Xanax and Ativan that we know have very high potential for dependency um, are deemed by the DEA as having low abuse potential. So you can, I think we'd all agree that this is a really absurd situation. Anyone who's in the medical community, in healthcare, would um, question how this scheduling ever occurred. And it's clear that this is done by law enforcement and not by medical professionals. Um, so when we talk about the NIDA monopoly, you've probably heard about this a lot this weekend. Um, NIDA is the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and they have a government-enforced monopoly on the legal supply of, of any FDA-approved marijuana research. So um, what's interesting is that marijuana is the only Schedule One drug that has this second review by NIDA and the DEA. So if you, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example here. If we look at, um, well, uh, first, uh, many of you know that there's only one facility in the country that's allowed to produce marijuana for FDA-approved trials, and that's at the University of Mississippi. And um, since if NIDA decides that they don't like your study for whatever reason, and in our case, we're looking at efficacy of marijuana, which is a big concern for them. Um, if, we're, if we were looking at the abuse potential of marijuana or the harmful side effects of marijuana, those studies usually get green-lighted quickly and they get government funding. But if you dare to say you want to study the efficacy of marijuana, it goes into sort of a permanent review process. It can be very, very challenging. Um, so what, what else is, um, is amazing about this is that the DEA and NIDA have no timetable for responding to a marijuana trial. So when you send a study design to the FDA, you will be guaranteed a response within 30 days. But NIDA has no such timetable, so they can take 10 months or 10 years to respond to your inquiry. Um, and this is um, a, an example of a, a study that MAPS had um, had submitted many years ago looking at vaporizers and how marijuana would be used in, you know, what, what the implications of using marijuana with vaporizers. And they asked to, for NIDA to sell them study drug, and that, dr that study is still in the pipeline waiting for implementation. But what, what's amazing is if you're doing an LSD study, you pretty much, you don't have that second review by NIDA, so you just move forward right into implementation. I'm not sure the public really is aware of that, and that's why we're trying to go around and talk more openly about these barricades to performing marijuana research and how um, unfounded they are. So um, let me 
me see here. Um, this is the good news is that this um, suppression of marijuana research is getting more and more mainstream media attention. You can see here's a big article in the New York Times. There have been many other articles in Atlantic Monthly and Washington Post and all kinds of, um, of mainstream media are starting to highlight the fact that this is unjust and deserves to be examined by the public. And this is, um, this is uh, the reason why we're motivated to look at treating um, or look at finding new treatments for PTSD or because you can see how many of uh, how many American citizens are plagued by PTSD, how many of our soldiers are going to be coming back to the U.S. struggling with PTSD, and you can see the amount of disability payouts just in 2010 for PTSD. It's a huge public health issue, a huge economic issue. Um, and now other, um, other media outlets now have been focusing on how inadequate the treatments are for PTSD, and this has really helped us create some public pressure on NIDA and the DEA to, um, to move this study forward. So you can see here that um, the veterans who are treated with conventional medicines, are, these meds are often totally inadequate. They often are riddled with a lot of side effects. And we know that the only two FDA-approved meds for treating PTSD are Zoloft and Paxil. And if you talk to vets who've tried these meds, they're you know, really disappointing in many ways. Some of them, if they do work, they're often um, dealing with side effects you know, um, ranging from sexual dysfunction to weight gain, and that can be terribly frustrating when you're trying to reintegrate into your family life and having to be, um, to suffer with those kind of side effects. And um, I think um, the, uh, uh, the other major reason that we want to study PTSD, of course, is because we have tons of anecdotal reports from our veterans saying that this has been a huge help to them. So the good news is that many more um, veterans are coming out and speaking publicly, even high-ranking vets are talking about their experience with marijuana and how it has been life-changing for them and how many times it's enabled them to get off the really addictive drugs that we've been prescribing them to close that chapter and simply use cannabis for symptom control. Um, and so that's been really important and that's kind of spurred on our, our interest in doing this study. And of course, the endocannabinoid system is really the pinnacle of all this. It's such a fascinating system. It is, um, it, th I think our study is going to answer a lot of questions about how the endocannabinoid system works. And um, certainly the fact that um, the, the meds that we traditionally prescribe to our veterans, such as you know, sleep aids that are hugely addictive, benzos, all these drugs are creating a lot of dependency in our vets, and we're desperately seeking alternative treatments that won't um, create that kind of addiction. So, um, let's see here. Um, so um, right now, there's no published data looking at treating combat veterans with PTSD with um, marijuana. So this would be the first and only trial of its kind in the world that would that would be actually a randomized controlled trial looking at um, treating um, these patients. And you can see here, this is the timeline for a traditional marijuana study, just so you have a sense of how this process works. Um, the FDA actually approved this trial about two years ago, and yet it still has not been allowed to be implemented. So you can see the day that MAPS got approval for, from the FDA, the same day they submitted their um, request for review to the Public Health Service and NIDA and the DEA, and um, and still, you know, we're waiting patiently for this process to be allowed to move forward. Now, this is Dr. El Soli. He's um, the head of the one cannabis production facility in the U.S. That he, so he works for NIDA, and he's got his hand in a barrel of ground-up marijuana. And uh, you can see here, if you take a look at this, is what happens with the you know they basically take the entire plant, throw it in a grinder and then roll it up into these cigarettes. It gets shipped out to various researchers around the country. And um, if you unroll the cigarettes, you dump it out and look at the contents, you can see it's actually um, not 
a lot of bud material. It's a lot of um, stems, sticks, and leaves that are um, a lot of extraneous material that al almost automatically sabotages an efficacy study from the very beginning. Um, and so that, that's very frustrating, but we're, we're not a, we, we want to work within this system and try to, um, to utilize the federally regulated legal system of, of accessing this NIDA marijuana. So um, you can see here um, our hypothesis is that we expect that marijuana will ease the symptoms of PTSD in a dose-dependent manner. So each time we raise the dose, we expect that people will probably get more relief in their PTSD symptoms, and this will be measured by the CAP scale, which is the most, you know, it's, it's sort of the gold standard in PTSD research. And we expect also, this is a really crucial part of our study, is that we expect that the, the arm of the study looking at a combination strain of cannabidiol and THC will be the most efficacious. So there's one arm of the study that looks at 6% cannabidiol and 6% THC. We're not even sure yet if, if um, NIDA can actually produce that strain, but they claim that they can, so we're hoping that they'll come through for us. And um, this is, you know, how we're going to be recruiting patients. I don't, it doesn't look like we're going to have any trouble recruiting. So far in the discussions we've had with vets around the state of Arizona, we have a long list of folks who are really eager to be screened for this study. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. And we expect, you know, we're, we're looking at treating 50 veterans who have documented treatment-resistant PTSD from their um, combat and um, you can see this is the typical inclusion criteria, and, and this is um, very, th this is a criteria that the FDA hailed as a really important and, and rigorous study design. So you can see here that, you know, they have to meet the definition of PTSD by CAP score. They have to meet criteria under DSM-4, um, excuse me, DSM-5, I guess. Well, DSM-4 criteria, and then they have to have tried and failed um, medication and psychotherapy. And you can see here other criteria that we're looking at. They can't have any other access one disorder. They can't have um, any personality disorder. They can't have. Um, they can't be a suicide risk. They can't have any other concurrent substance abuse problem. And they actually have to be. They have to have a negative urine drug screen when they start the study. So a lot of our patients who are already, you know, our, our vets who are actively using cannabis will be asked to wash out um, for the month prior. So that's going to be challenging, and that will probably knock out a lot of our patients right off the bat. But it's really, it was important to us that they have that um, washout period prior to this so we can persuade the public that these folks were truly free from from previous substance abuse. And then um, these are the different scales that we're going to be evaluating throughout the study, and you can see how rigorous this is. These scales are really well-tested um, parts of, of other psychiatric study designs, and they're really, um, they have a lot of credibility in the medical community. And then, um, of course, we have a bunch of safety measures that we've been asked to implement by the FDA so we're going to be doing um, two different safety sessions with patients when they first start the study. They're going to be um, basically taught how to deliver the medication. Um, so they'll be randomized into one of two delivery methods. They'll either be in a smoke group, smoking, or vaporizing. And that's how we'll, we'll standardize the actual um, delivery of the medicine. So many of these patients may never have used a vaporizer. So we're going to teach them how to use that that device and hopefully make it consistent then among all the patients who are participating. Um, during these four-hour safety sessions, they'll be administered their first dose of study drug, and they'll will be monitoring them for adverse events. If they have an adverse reaction, a panic attack, or psychotic episode, then we'll be able to um, manage that medically and decide, you know, certainly they'll be allowed to de-enroll from the study at that point if they choose to. Um, but we, we're going to try to get a really good mix of patients who have experience with cannabis and patients who are totally naive to the drug so we can really um, see, you know, a have a good balance to examine later and analyze after. 
So, um, so yeah, these safety sessions are going to be really valuable. And I think um, each patient then, um, once they're enrolled in the study, they'll be given a one-week supply of the drug, which is basically they'll get two grams a day. So each of those cigarettes that you guys saw from NIDA is about a gram each. And this is the breakdown on the different arms of the study. So you can see here how the dosing is going to work. We actually have a placebo-controlled marijuana from NIDA. It's like an alcohol wash, you know, where all the THC is leached out of the plant. So it looks um, identical to the regular plant. Um, and then there's four other dosages that will be offered to patients, so anywhere from 2% all the way up to 12%, and then with uh, that one combination arm that had the CBD plus the THC. So patients are going to be doing four weeks of home self-administration, which is part of the um, the pushback that we're getting from NIDA. They have a very deep concern about people managing marijuana at home and self-titrating. They think that it's potentially dangerous because the study drug may be diverted and, um, and they don't think that anybody else apparently has marijuana in the community. So it's very scary. Um, so I think um, this has been really frustrating because most of the, um, you know, the, the pharmaceutical company studies like Sativex and these other drugs, they all rely on self-titration. It's not really fair to a patient who is naive. It's, it's not ethical, I'd say, to, you know, if you have a patient that's naive to marijuana and they get randomized into a 12% THC arm, and you're going to demand that they smoke or vaporize the entire amount of the drug every day, it would be, um, it would be unethical and inhumane probably for a patient who, you know, who'd never had experience with that. And so we want to encourage patients to self-titrate so that we can understand how much they actually need each day to manage their symptoms, and then they're going to bring back the unused marijuana each week. Now, a lot of people are claiming that's, you know, ridiculous and that no Nobody's going to bring it back, but the truth is that um, they are going to get back all of the unused marijuana at the end of the study, so that already creates an incentive for them. Um, the other reason is that these patients who are participating in the study truly care about science because there is no reason that a patient would voluntarily enter this study when they could simply buy <laughs> cannabis on the black market and get probably a much better quality than what NIDA is providing. So I think that these people are going to be committed to adhering to the protocol. And certainly if they don't, if there's evidence that they're not adhering completely, then they'll be terminated from the study. So we're, you know, the FDA felt that this protocol was not only acceptable, but really optimal. And that's why they approved it. And it's just frustrating to see that NIDA doesn't, you know, see the, the value of this. Um, so in the, you can see there, the four weeks of home self-administration then will occur um, during this initial, the, the top box. They'll, they'll be randomized into one of these dosage arms. Then there's two weeks of an abstinence period. So patients are actually going to be asked to, they'll be cut off from their study drug for a full two weeks, and they'll be continued... Um, They'll be monitored aggressively throughout that period to make sure that, to, to, you know, to understand if they have a relapse of their symptoms, to check their blood cannabidiol levels and see how things are, um, are evolving during those two weeks. And then they'll be re-randomized into the second four weeks of home administration where they'll be hopefully, you know, they'll be re-randomized into a different dosage, but they'll stay in the same delivery method. So if they were smoking the first four weeks, they'll continue that. Um, but you can see here that um, in the second round, we eliminate the placebo. We eliminate the lower dosages and let people see if they were. So this could be really helpful. If somebody's in a 2% THC in round one and then they get re-randomized into a 12%, it could be really interesting for us to analyze that data. And um, this is the, well, like we talked about, the, the two different delivery methods. And I'm sure all of you have seen the volcano vaporizer. We're not um, endorsing this product, but it just happens to be a gold standard for um, for conducting marijuana research. And certainly the, the opportunity to look at vaporizers as a potential to not 
um, to, to, you know, as physicians, we have a, a bias that we don't want people to smoke anything. So vaporizers offer a lot of hope for us as a potential way that patients can avoid um, inhaling um, products of combustion. And so that's really um, important to our medical community. So we really want to examine. We're getting a lot of um, resistance from the medical community about the fact that we even have a smoking arm at all in this study. And that's been um, really challenging to try to negotiate with my peers about the importance of conducting science in a comprehensive way and looking at all delivery methods. I don't think there's any value to only studying vaporizers. We need to look at all forms of the way this drug can be um, utilized. So this is just a schematic of the entire study, just so you guys can see how intense this is, actually. This is going to be a really rigorous um, scientific process. It's going to involve a, a lot of staff. And um, you can see the, the schematic shows you the, the two safety sessions at the beginning, the four weeks of home self-administration, the, the two weeks of abstinence, then getting re-randomized into this second four weeks of self-administration, and then another two weeks of abstinence. And then at the end of that process, they'll be allowed, they'll be given back their unused marijuana, and then they'll be continued in um, a one-year follow-up process. So there'll be a, um, a period um, where we'll be examining what choices these vets make um, if they decide to maybe get their card in Arizona and become... Um, you know, a legit medical marijuana user, if they decide to go back to the VA system and try to use just conventional psych meds or, or maybe a combination of those things, or maybe they simply, you know, fall off the grid and go back, you know, go into some type of illicit drug abuse. We're going to be examining all those things and monitoring them for that full year after. And um, these are the safety precautions that the FDA asked us to implement, right? So they wanted us to give each patient a lockbox to make sure that they could <laughs> store the drug safely and securely. They wanted us to have secondary verifiers there. So every time the patient administers the study drug to themselves, they're required to videotape each of the sessions. And we are, our study coordinators are going to be reviewing the video to make sure that none of the study drug is ever diverted, um, that it's used thoroughly, and then whatever portion is unused would go back into the lockbox. So all that has to be um, recorded on video, and we'll be communicating with our secondary verifiers regularly to ensure that you know there's nothing devious happening here. Um, and then, um, let's see, what else do we have here? Well, and this is, you know, you guys already know all about the NIDA monopoly and the, the effort that MAPS has been, has undertaken to try to enable Professor Craker to become a second facility in the U.S. that would actually produce, you know, high quality cannabis for FDA approved research. And this has been a huge um, uh, legal battle that's gone on for many years, as you can see, and um, deeply frustrating that last week we found out that the U.S. Um, the U.S. Court of Appeals has turned down this request again. So um, I don't know. I, I I guess you guys have probably are already aware that the DEA at one point, the DEA's own administrative law judge did feel that it was in the public interest to have a second facility that could produce cannabis for all these studies that are currently either in review or being denied. So it's really um, it, ironic that their own judge um, felt that this was crucial, and yet the DEA's um, director, Michelle Leonhardt, turned down the judge's recommendation and, and continues to deny Professor Craker that second license. So... Um, this is, uh, the, the timing of this, I think, was interesting to all of us, that it was six days before Obama was inaugurated that, that Michelle Leonhardt rejected this request. And um, I think um, this is just a, 
more examples of all the legal wranglings that are happening back and forth. You know, Rick and MAPS have managed to get one of the best, you know, most prestigious law firms in the country in D.C. to take this case on pro bono. And that, I think that speaks volumes about how the public understands the injustice of this. But sadly, we haven't made, none of these legal battles have produced any victory except for the DEA. All these delays benefit the DEA and they hurt our veterans who desperately need access to this study and to this information that would come out of this study. So um, I think uh, this quote by Dr. Sabin really sums it up best for me. I think that if we know there's a plant that has this kind of uh, potential to reduce human suffering, we as physicians, as scientists, as human beings, we have a duty to demand that this plant be studied properly. And I think we have a duty to insist that it, the implementation of high-level, rigorous science should never be shackled by politics. And that's why we have now um, created this political action committee just as a desperate effort to try to um, work through the political process that we've never really participated in. We've tried, we thought that just making good arguments, um, sane, rational arguments was going to be enough to persuade changes in public policy. But sadly, that has not happened. And now we've um, opened up this pack called Americans for Scientific Freedom, where we're going to be enabling, um, hopefully, better relationships with elected officials and, and start opening up dialogue and conversations with them. And I'll give you some examples of some of the um, work that we're trying to do now. Um, this is the description of what ASF is going to be involved in, and this is our website. And just so you're aware, you know, we, this PAC actually has funding but um, we want to become a super PAC. So in order to do that, we have to collect 500 donations of $10 a piece from anywhere in the country. So we're working on that now. And so anybody who wants to participate, we'd be most grateful if, if you want to um, give 10 bucks towards us. That what's interesting is that we, we have a, a really decent amount of funding to make um, political contributions, but we're limited because we're not a super PAC. And in order to get on the radar of these elected officials. You really have to um, get to that level. So I'm hoping that, um, that we'll be there eventually. And this is just some examples of some initiatives that we're working on. So we managed to get the um, Arizona Medical Association and our county medical society to pass a resolution that would um, basically says that we that the physician community believes that we need to eliminate all barriers to marijuana research, and this was a huge culture change because surprisingly, you know, the physicians, especially in Arizona, are supremely conservative, and so to get them to understand that um, the injustice of suppressing this marijuana research this was a big achievement. And this is excuse me, this is just the language from the resolution. And then um, you can see here that it's very detailed about exp that, that these groups be realize that having this second review by NIDA, even after the FDA and the university's IRB have already approved a study, that they, they sense that this is an absurd situation, that it's redundant and unnecessary. So they're, they're saying basically that, that once um, a study is approved by the DEA and the university's institutional review board, that it would meet, immediately move to implementation and NIDA would be required to sell study drug to us at cost. So um, I guess that's it. I want to make sure before running out of time. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm out of time. I want to respect your guys' uh, opportunity to, for a break, but if anybody has questions, I'd be grateful, you know, I'd be honored to take any. Yeah. Sure, yeah, cannabidiol, oh yeah, you bet. Um, yeah, he's asking, what do we mean when we say CBD? CBD is cannabidiol, it's one of what, 60 different cannabinoids in the plant, and it's a really um, fascinating area of research now. I think CBD is, is clearly gonna be um, a huge push um, amongst 
big pharma and amongst all of us, we're all really interested in understanding more about this. But you'll see um, big pharma is pouring millions of dollars into trying to understand more about CBD because CBD offers... Um, it seems to be a non-psychoactive cannabinoid. And I think you guys will hear, for those of you who are coming to the workshop on Monday, you're going to hear um, Fred um, from California who, who's on Project CBD, and they're spending an incredible amount of resources to try to understand how CBD works. But it seems to be a mediator for pain relief. It seems to buffer some of the negative um, psychoactive effects of THC, so it seems to um, have sort of an, um, an antipsychotic action um, when it's used in combination with THC, so really interesting. So, yeah. Go. Oh, I'm sorry. Should I go to the mic, or do you guys? Okay, yeah, sorry. Well, uh, this is on the same topic, CBD. Um, you said there were no controlled studies on cannabis for PTSD. I'm sure that's true, but there was a brilliant set of studies in Brazil in the 1980s on Anxiety, and anxiety is the general category for PTSD, right. and the chemical they used was CBD. The study author was Zawardi and Guimaraes, and I read that paper, even though I'm not a scientist. A very, very good paper. Yeah. And so CBD for anxiety is a known fact since the 1980s, but the test had to take place in Brazil. So my next question is this. Since we have PTSD in Canada, why not run these studies in Canada? Because the night of monopoly does not extend across the border. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think um, I understand from my colleagues who are here from Canada that that so it seems to be um, almost as difficult, not quite as as bad as of the night of monopoly we have. But they said that there's a lot of restrictions there too. Um, I know that we have some really courageous. Um, colleagues in Canada who've managed to make it happen, Mark Ware and all kinds of um, good folks up there that are trying to do this type of work. So I think we would be happy to conduct the studies wherever we can, and we would certainly be open to moving the study to Canada if we thought there was any inroad there. But I think we're not going to give up the fight here in the U.S. because we have to demand that this study be done. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. That's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question with regard to everything that's been discussed in the previous talk about um, kind of integrating our attempts to legitimize these substances as medicine within mm -hmm. you know a popular framework that will be well received. Why use smoked and vaporized marijuana at all as opposed to an orally active product? Great question. Yeah, I think um, for the purpose of the study, it felt that um, you know the. The investigators who were developing the study design felt that it was easiest to titrate a dosage um, if you were vaporizing or smoking. With the edible forms, it seems that um, the 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 uh, how do you say the um, prolonged or the delayed onset of action with oral forms was a concern, and the and the prolonged um, efficacy sometimes makes it difficult to predict how people are going to respond. And so we wanted to give to empower patients to really have a very um, precise ability to, to titrate their dose. So that was the hope. But I think down the road, we're hoping to use all those forms. And if we can you know, break through the NIDA monopoly, we're definitely going to examine all of it and try to really get a, a very robust picture. So good, good point. Yeah. Great. Thank you for your commitment to this important work. And I'm curious, who makes up NIDA? and who appoints them, are they prone to lobbying efforts, and why are they so resistant? Yeah, good questions. Um, I think, um, I don't know. Um, so National Institute on Drug Abuse is run by Nora Volkow, who's a really uh, esteemed researcher, and she's actually she's a very good person, but um, their mission, the mission of NIDA, is clearly to curb all illicit drug abuse, so that's, it's an uh, the absurd situation that they're required then to to manage the supply of study drug for marijuana studies, which are clearly on their radar as being a drug of abuse that they need to suppress. Um, I don't know um, how. I, that's a great question, and I'll I'll find out. I'm sure Rick Doblin knows um, who makes up that and how they get there. I don't I don't know if they're appointed by the go. I, I but but they are. Um, researchers, but unfortunately they're mostly basic science researchers. So the difference between FDA and, and NIDA is FDA is more clinical researchers and 
these guys at NIDA are more bench, basic science research. So they don't really, when you talk about doing a study on whole plant medicine, it doesn't resonate with them very much. So good, good question. So I, I will, can I just say that um, we did, you know, through our PAC, we have been, you know, targeting selectively certain elected officials to try to persuade them to send a letter to HHS um, to Catherine Sibelius asking her to, to end this second review. And we've made finally some inroads by, by building these relationships with elected officials. Um, Rick and the team at MAPS wrote a really elegant letter um, which has gone to our congressional delegation and is going to be submitted. And these are amazing um, steps, you know, incremental changes that I've seen just from this simple intervention with this PAC, we've been able to open doors with elected officials that never existed. So I'm really excited about the potential for that. Yeah. Dr. Sisley, you've been uh, absolutely indefatigable and, and, and staunch in uh, your work trying to break through uh, this NIDA monopoly and um, uh, in, in favor of folks that have put their ass on the line for our freedom. And so I, I want to, first of all, I want to commend you for that. Thank you. Um, awesome. Thank uh, it's you. the work that you've done and the work that uh, folks like Dr. Modi Mordecai in, in Tel Aviv uh, have done that I think uh, will ultimately uh, result in, in our prevailing on this issue. So my question really is, um, you know, it's, it's in, the, in the realm of politics, uh, the, uh, a relatively uh, new convention has been the formation of these uh, super uh, political action committees. Um, and so I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, your thoughts about super PACs and, and, uh, um, and how all of us perhaps could um, uh, play a role in supporting um, any super PACs that, that might be doing work um, to break through this night of monopoly. Yeah, oh, that's terrific. Thank you very much. I, I think um, one of the things that, I, I was hoping to do was um, to try to persuade you guys to join my Facebook page because I'm going to try to keep everybody, when you ask about how to get involved, I, I made these little cards and so if anybody's interested in, in finding out how they can participate in the pack, um, we have a website now called AmericansForScientificFreedom.com and you can just go on the website and learn more about our, um, our efforts to try to change the environment here and I think um, um, the two biggest things that we've done, at least on the local level so far, are we have a bill at the legislature. This, you know, uh, many of the states have banned marijuana on university campuses now, and um, because they're afraid of losing their federal funding through the Controlled Substances Act, so they're they're. There's all, all this legislation is starting to pop up around the country saying you can't have marijuana on campus. And what's happened in, in as a sort of accidentally is that that has suppressed marijuana research from being able to be done at the universities and it was a they claim it's an unintended consequence but it's deeply frustrating because when studies are required to move off campus if you've ever had an experience of trying to go to a landlord in the private sector and ask them can I rent space for marijuana research it's you know you're not embraced with open arms and so the, really the universities need to be a sanctuary for marijuana research and we are working hard um, our PAC is trying to get um, Arizona to allow this back on campus and we have a bill that's working its way really um, effectively through the legislature now it looks like it is going to pass we already have the governor who's gone on record to say that she'll sign the bill if it gets there so that's just one example of, of ways that we can change the environment. The other thing that is really interesting is that um, the, all the medical marijuana programs in the state, in, in the country, um, are many of them are generating surplus money. And I'll give you an example. In Arizona, we have $7 million in surplus that has generated from only, our program's only been in existence two years, and it's only partially implemented. We only now, just in the last couple months, have dispensaries that have, have opened. Um, and yet, this surplus is, is voter protected, and it's sitting 
in the account of the Arizona Health Department, trying to figure out what can be done with it. And so we're trying, our, our PAC is trying to make uh, an initiative to get this money allocated for marijuana research. And it, we've gotten, you know, you can imagine a tremendous amount of resistance from the, that in the Arizona community, you know, and I shouldn't say, the Arizona government officials who are nervous about how that will affect them politically. But the Arizona community seems to be very supportive of this idea. And so we're working hard through different channels, um, through the Attorney General and other ways to try to see that, that this money be allowed to be used for that purpose, even just a portion of it. You know, our study here of $7 million surplus, this study um, we, pr we expect to cost about $250,000. And the biggest expense of conducting this study is buying the study drug from NIDA. That's why we're asking the them to sell a study drug at cost because that's the, the, the biggest chunk of it is um, trying to buy the, the study drug. So anyway, yeah, I'm sorry, I'll jump to that. Testing. Uh, have you ever done a survey on approximately how many veterans are using marijuana to treat their PTSD syndromes as opposed to the, that, the conventional? Right. And and that's a great uh, idea, and that's something that we're we're starting to embark on now because we see that we're not making any headway and pushing through yeah. the NIDA monopoly. That we're going to uh, start working on purely observational studies where we're not um, managing study drug, and we're just going to start um, collecting data, just like what you said on how many vets are using it now, and how many have have walked away from their other meds or whatever, yeah. or using it in combination. So I'm in a. Uh, PTSD program in Chico, California. Okay. And uh, I'd say conservatively, 60% of the veterans are using marijuana. Wow. And one of the interesting things that's happened, we have rehab center in Roseburg yep. at White City, Oregon, and they have a no drug policy, you have to be drug free for 30 days before you attend. Uh, what happened, the guys were not showing up anymore because they couldn't, didn't want to get off their, their marijuana. Right. And um, I know when I entered the VA system 20 years ago, I told them, like, the Zoloft and all that stuff is just too invasive. One of the counselors pulled me aside and says, hey, marijuana. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of funny that the, the research is so far behind the reality. It's true. It's and, true. And uh, there's some damn good pot up here, let me tell you. That's <laughs> I love it. Good for you. you oh, sure. You, you got it. They're, they're letting me. They're letting me get one more question. Anybody who wants to go? Hi there. Uh, oh, I'm, Bob oh. I'm Bob Swanson. I work for Alameda County Supervisor Nate Miley. Welcome to Alameda County, everybody. Okay. Uh, my boss wrote the medical marijuana ordinance here in Oakland when he was on the city council, and he wrote the medical marijuana okay. ordinance for, for Alameda County. And uh, in your talk here, I can see that uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse still has a cloud of stupidity hanging over there. <laughs> Their offices and they're inhaling deeply. Um, <laughs> you were talking about the quality of marijuana that they produce. Uh, what are you going to do? Request it from and throw it out and then go buy some? No, I wish. Yeah, we we have to um, abide by that material that they send us and use it. You know, obviously, very judiciously and per the protocol that the FDA has approved. What we may do, though, just to make sure, is we may consider doing kind of a secondary lab testing to verify that what they claim they gave us, if it's whether it's 2% THC or 12%, that it actually is consistent with what they're reporting. So that might be the only um, other safeguard we have to implement, but otherwise we're stuck with it. Until um, Professor Craker's case is victorious and he's finally able to create his own facility, we're, we're going to be stuck with this material. I know. Uh, well, I get one more, huh? Yeah. Hi, Sue. Um, oh, hi so I really appreciate this American scientific freedom. I think it really paves the way for more meaningful scientific and medical inquiry. But um, so as a whole part of this movement and this path, um, is it functioning on a state level? Because you're doing a lot of stuff in terms of um, changing the NIDA monopoly on, the, on an Arizona level. But 
is it going to function more on a, a federal level? That's a great question, yeah, because since our research is federally regulated, it's really important that we reach elected officials at the federal level. So what's happened with the PAC is we've filed both as a federal PAC and a state PAC. We're recognized by the FEC and our state secretary of state's office. And we're, all the initiatives that we're doing are taking a world, you know, a, a national view. So even the, the efforts that we have in Arizona working on bringing marijuana research back on campus will benefit the country because w this will set a big precedent that other states will be able to utilize to fight the same battle that we are. Same thing with the, um, with the, medical, the surplus money from each medical marijuana program. I wanted to um, beg Drug Policy Alliance or MPP to take this on and we sh I think we should inventory every um, medical marijuana state to see what type of surplus funds they've generated and make a case to demand that that money be used for research and so I think that that's something that our PAC is definitely going to be taking on so um, we would be so grateful if, if any of you would be willing to Facebook me I'd be honored to have you as friends and we could continue this dialogue and keep this groundswell going so thank you all for coming oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's definitely because it's a, a, both a federal and state pack. You absolutely we can accept donations from anywhere, and all we need are the ten dollar. So anyone who wants to be more generous, it's really not necessary. If you can just go with the ten bucks, that'll enable us to get that super pack status that we need. Yeah, so we need five hundred of them. So if everybody here did it, then we'd be set. But you know, I appreciate. It. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the conference.